Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast episode number 50. Woo, yeah. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. On what is actually our final normal show of 2016. Dun, dun, dun. That, that sounds like we're changing the format, Dan. Like, you know, we're, we're going to become an Atari podcast. That's it. We've had enough of all the other consoles. <laughs> now, actually, we are recording this a week before Christmas. And uh, next week, though, on the Retro Hour, it is going to be uh, the first, hopefully annual, Retro Hour Super Quiz. Oh, Super Quiz. Big Christmas quiz. This is going to be good. I'm already looking forward to this. I've started writing some of the questions already. Yeah, so. and uh, we've kind of prepared the place. We're going to go for free drinks and uh, pre-drinks even. There's <laughs> free drinks? Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> I'm not offering these, no. And uh, we've got Aaron from RGDS, formerly, yeah. podcast coming over, and he's going to have a laugh. And probably he's got some Christmas chip tunes as well he's going to be playing. And I think it's his birthday day after, so uh, yeah, a little, uh, little pre-party for Aaron. Joe's going to be joining us as well. We've got Christmas jumpers. The studio's going to be all Christmassy. We've already got the tinsel up in here. so Oh, yeah, it's going to be great. And uh, then the week afterwards, we're going to have a week off. What? I know, it's shocking, but uh, we've been doing this for 50 episodes now, constantly, every week. So um, between Christmas and New Year, we're going to have one off, and then we'll return back to the normal retro hour schedule. Now, there are two reasons for doing this. Um, first of all, We'll probably be drunk most of that week anyway. Yeah. And uh, secondly, we get so many people saying, oh, I'm still catching up on your shows. I'm up to like episode 20 now. <laughs> so we're like, yeah. we figured it'd give you a bit of a chance to catch up over Christmas and New Year. And also you won't be um, totally devoid of Ravi and Dan because we're going to have some YouTube videos and all this kind of stuff coming up. So there'll Absolutely. be plenty of stuff. We'll still be around. Yeah. And I'm sure I'll be doing a live stream at Christmas as well, a DJ one. So today, our final guest of 2016... Now, we've saved this guy for episode 50 because I, I think this is probably one of the most interesting interviews we've ever done. Yeah, and it's uh, one of the most oddly structured interviews as well. It's hilarious. <laughs> like, he's really good. This is Mel Croucher, and this guy worked from, like, programming pianos and punch cards, early military mainframes to kind of, you know, doing the first game with a soundtrack. He made the first computer game company mm -hmm. in the UK. Now, looking at kind of some of the stuff he's been involved with, he's a writer, um, wrote for many magazines, he's done books, even stuff like the Amos book for the Amiga, yeah, well, yeah. random stuff like that. And uh, he did the first game with the soundtrack, first multimedia travel guide. He was also, get this, the first mixed-raced lesbian blogger on Teletext with Tourette's named Doreen. Oh, yes, that's definitely unique. <laughs> this will give you a little indication of where this interview is going to be going in a bit. Uh, made the first interactive movie. He hired Ian, Ian Drury, John Pertwee, Doctor Who, and uh, Frankie Howard to it's, star in this Spectrum game, I think it was. It's crazy. Yeah, Deus Ex, yeah. which was a massive game. And he even hijacked a radio station to broadcast his own software late at night as well. Oh, yeah, so this is <laughs> definitely a guest worthy of a 50th episode. Absolutely. Mel Croucher is going to be on the Retro Hour in around 20 minutes from now. And, of course, this show would not have been possible throughout 2016 without your very generous donations. We do have a little PayPal link on the front page of the retrohour.com if maybe you have a few too many Christmas sherries and you're feeling a bit generous. Yeah, or any unwanted gifts. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much to this week's donations, uh, which comes from Christian Spains, Magnus Esbjorna, Peter lingback Peterson. SJ and Gordau Trading. So thank you so much for all your donations during the week, guys. And of course, if you want to see this show continuing throughout 2017, keep your donations coming. They all go back into the running of the show. We appreciate every penny that we get. We get some people saying, oh, I only donated a euro, and you said it was generous. Any donation is generous, honestly, yeah, guys. Yeah. It all goes back into our uh, you know, hosting costs and all that for the show, theretrohour.com. And also, if you uh, check out our website this weekend, hopefully if my computer's finished rendering it now. <laughs> oh, God, you've been in a bit of a, a, a crashing nightmare, haven't you? Well, we had the Retro Hour kind of Christmas pre-party, didn't we, on Saturday night? Yeah, pre-drinks. It was uh, pretty good, and we played some cool games. Arcade games, uh, old-school Sega stuff. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, we've filmed all of that, so that's going to be chucked out on YouTube this week. It's currently rendering on my PC at home. It's uh, about 32 minutes long. It's got about three hours left to render when I uh, nipped out to come in the studio <laughs> tonight. So if you want to check that video out, we'll pop that in the show notes at theretrohour.com. So one final thing before we get into the news this week as well. We have been busy this week, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, we've been totally on it for Christmas. I don't know how we've found the time, <laughs> but um, we're on another, pon uh, another podcast, which is Console Shock with Trevor and Stuart, and they basically run a store in London called Play Nation, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a gaming retro store. And they do Amiga Nights sometimes, and it's really good. You should check it out. Yeah, and I think their podcast, it's kind of an irregular one. I think maybe do it about once a month at the moment. Really cool guys, and we just got, you know, 
really geeky and nerdy and started talking about, you know, memories and game systems that we love. It was a really interesting show, actually. Yeah, it's good to actually be interviewed rather than yeah. be the uh, interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> On the other side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, then, before we get to Mel Croucher, let's get into this week's stories. Now, have you seen retro games have come to Facebook Messenger? Oh, no, I always keep getting invited to like Tower Castle Command or Fruit Saga 7 or something. This is better than all those. So, um, you know, obviously now, if you want to write to anyone in Messenger on Facebook, it kind of opens you, you know, in that little window or in a new app as well. Well, if you look at the bottom of the uh, Facebook chat widget, there is a little joypad there. Oh, yeah, I noticed that the other day. I haven't pressed it yet. So you press play a game, and then there's a little list comes up. Pac-Man's in there, Arkanoid, Space Invaders, Track and Field... (laughs) Mm. Gallagher. Buster move. So if I click on play as well, it actually opens a little widget on your screen. This works on mobile too. Even got the sound effects. Oh, wow. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, literally, I've been like lying in bed. (laughs) Like 11 o'clock at night just playing that. My girlfriend's like, turn that screen off. It's good. It's like Snake on your phone or something. You know when you had these little games on kind of systems, messengers like... Not really a fun app, is it? It's kind of a boring messaging system. But yeah, this stuff adds like nice stuff. The emoticons were nice, but this is cooler. Yeah, and the the proper arcade ports as well. You know, they're not. Oh like, yeah, they must have paid for these and got uh, you know full rights for them and everything. Yeah, so um, you'll find that you know if you're on Facebook, uh, just click on a message to someone you look out for that little joypad icon. We'll also pop a little TechCrunch article if you want to see what's in there in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, back in the summer. We were talking about some like classic Sega games um, that were going to be made into movies. Do you remember? We thought that was, you know, we were kind of talking about which games would make good films. Yeah, yeah, because we always kind of get hear about these games turning into films and, you know, there's always like rumours and stuff. Sega are kind of respecting a lot of their legacy at the moment and going back, you know, to their their roots a little bit, if you like. And they've actually um, decided they're going to make some TV shows and kind of TV movies of some of their classic franchises. Now, obviously, Sonic the Hedgehog has been made into films and TV shows and that kind of thing. Uh, but they've actually launched a production company called Stories International. Now, okay. this is um, one of Sega's like, spin-off companies. And uh, <laughs> apparently, they're going to make Altered Beast and Streets of Rage into movies. Well, Streets of Rage would be classic, I think. Altered Beast, I'm not sure how they'd do that. It would like American Werewolf or something, I don't know. <laughs> Well, you know, I was thinking about this as well, and we were playing Streets of Rage 2 on Saturday night in this video, yeah. and I actually make a, make a comment in this video that it kind of reminds me of those late like, 80s kind of cyberpunk movies like Robocop 2 and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's got that, or even the Turtles movies had that kind of feel to it, you know. But I think you can make a really good kind of, you know, kind of throwback movie to that era out of Streets of Rage, obviously not make it too serious, but a bit naff. Yeah, yeah, it could be good, and all the characters are so recognisable as well. You know, you'd have Axel, and mm-hmm. he'd be the kind of all-American guy. You know, <laughs> it, it could be really well done. And Altered Beast, I mean, uh, there's an article here on AV Club, I think they say it best. Um, they say Altered Beast is essentially a cheesy movie, masquerading itself as a video game. It's a grim fantasy set in ancient Greece and features men in speedos who turn into assorted beasts. Oh, but, sounds like my kind of film. <laughs> <laughs> but they're also saying, you know, these are the first two that are kind of slated to be movies. They also reckon Shinobi, which I think we did mention back in the summer, could be a film. The House of the Dead. Oh, yeah. yeah good zombie definitely. film out of that. And a Crazy Taxi as well. Oh, yeah. I don't know how Crazy Taxi would work. Um, maybe with Queen Latifah. But... Um... <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's cool that Sega are trying something new. You know, they've got these old franchises. Might be nice to see new video games. Well, they had Silent Hill was a a really big movie as well, wasn't it? And all these, there's been a few good ones and there's been a few bad ones. So we'll we'll have to see. And Mario, of course, was the ultimate flop. Yeah, Mario Bros. You could probably count the amount of good video game movies on one hand. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, as a fan of these franchises, I think it's pretty cool. You know, I'll, I'll look out for them. Yeah, definitely. So tell us about the Retro Sigma. Yes, the Retro Sigma is yet another mini console. Here we go. There's Just when you thought you didn't have enough. Yeah, there's tons of them coming out on the market, but the Retro Sigma is $60, they're saying. Okay. Which okay. is really kind of cheap, but it supports 28 classic systems. That's a hell of a lot. And uh, if you look at it, it actually kind of looks really like the Mega Drive, <laughs> just in silver. I love the way they've got four core where 16-bit used to be written on top of the Mega Drive. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so they've obviously got some kind of ARM thing in there that's going to be a, a quad-core processor. Mm-hmm. But they're saying the really cool thing about this is uh, it's got a plug-and-play installer so you can download games, configurations, new emulations straight away. 
but you can also use your smartphone and keyboard as game controllers, mm -hmm. which I find really useful because I got this Pico 8 pocket thing and um, the controls are rubbish touching on this keyboard. If I could just connect with my phone and play it, that would be so good. Well, this thing, I mean, it's, uh, I'm just reading about it now. It's ARM-based then, isn't it? Imagine, essentially, it's probably like Raspberry Pi kind of hardware inside. Yeah, yeah, just probably a bit more upgraded. And I mean, you know, for $60, you buy a Pi. You know, that's about 30 anyway, I think, isn't it? Yeah. And you get a case for it, it's about a tenner as well. So, essentially, for an extra ten, you're getting this really cool, like, you know, Mega Drive-looking case, and it all pre-configured out the box as well, so... Well, I think the plug-and-play thing's definitely an advantage, because all this other stuff you get, you're spending weeks reconfiguring emulators, getting all the right ROMs and all of this. If you can download it straight away, it really saves a lot of time. Yeah, and apparently it's already, like, set up as a, you know, media centre with 4K support as well, so... Oh, wow. Yeah, maybe it is a bit more powerful. Yeah, it's pretty cool. A good price as well for it. Yeah, definitely. Um, you kind of get into, like, you know, the the mini NES kind of price category there, but obviously that's a system that can do a lot more than the uh, the Nintendo one. Yeah, definitely. And it says it also comes with a little analog controller, a retro controller, micro SD with 16 gig capacity. All right, okay. So all that <laughs> comes with it for that price yeah, as well. Yeah, not bad at all. Yeah. So maybe, you know, if, if like me at the moment, your missus is asking you like, what do you want for Christmas? And you've decided, yeah. Good little, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see if it's out by then. Hopefully it will be. We'll put that information in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, I don't know what's going on at the moment with the Amstrad CPC. It's suddenly like the coolest retro platform to port things to, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I've seen tons of stuff coming out. And I remember a while ago they were doing these... They started doing demos for the CPC with full motion video. Yeah. And it just knocked my socks off. It's insane. I mean, we've talked before on the show that we haven't got, you know, a lot of experience with the Amstrad. Um, you know, I, I kind of had a friend at school that used one and, you know, whenever he's had some plays now and then. But apart from that, never really used one. But I do know that it's got this really good graphical mode, like really high resolution with about four colours on there. And now, believe it or not, someone has actually ported Super Mario Brothers <laughs> to the Amstrad CPC 464. And you've got to check out the YouTube video of this. We were watching it before we started recording. It actually looks, I mean, you know, it's lower color depth. It's only got four colors from what I can see on this video. But I think the resolution of that is higher and sharper than the, the NES version. Yeah, and uh, you've got a little pause on the scroll before yeah. it goes, but it's only a half a millisecond or something. You know, it's, it's not that. Bad. And check, check the music out. What sound tip did they have on the CPC, man? That sounds wicked. Better than the NES. Yeah. <laughs> sounds like an orchestra. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And apparently they're doing a port to the Commodore 64 soon as well, which apparently won't look quite as sharp, but, you know, it'd be interesting to see that too. But they've actually compiled this, so um, it will work on a 64K Amstrad CPC 464. That's majorly impressive. So, like, and, you know, they've ripped all the kind of sprites directly off Mario, so you've got the clouds and the kind of cubes and everything. And it looks really smooth, you know, the character sprites and everything look awesome on it. I'm actually quite tempted. That, that might be my news resolution, get hold of an Amstrad CPC now, I think. It seems to be, like, the retro platform at the moment that's impressing me the most. Yeah, get into it, and uh, I'll come round and you can explain it all. <laughs> <laughs> it give me six months to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> So our good friend Rob Hubbard has uh, had a bit of good news this week. Yeah, Rob Hubbard. He's one of the best composers on the C64. Well, actually, I'd say he's one of the best musician composers ever. And he did tunes like Monty on the Run, you know, which is just absolutely fantastic. Skate or Die, Desert yeah. Strike. Oh, yeah. And he's um, basically been given an honorary degree to recognise it. And this is um, very interesting because they don't usually give these honorary degrees to video game musicians <laughs> but you know rob's massive so it's at the abafi university in dundee and uh you know they're saying he's best known for his prestigious and wide-ranging 80s games and uh he's basically done most of the c64 tunes that debuted on there well i think you know we've had lots of you know kind of commodore 64 and spectrum musicians and amiga musicians on this show and he's the one name that everyone points out as being like you know the guy that influenced them or you know their kind of hero yeah i'd love to get him on the show that would be amazing well let's make it happen in 2017 yeah, yeah let's that's that's <laughs> our new year's resolution there you go so yeah congratulations rob that's awesome to see you know a mainstream academic uh, university um honoring someone who's 
famous for doing video game music back in the day. Stuff though. like Commando, you yeah. know. It's like, and I think this kind of music is getting a lot more recognition now. So, like, you know, there's uh, orchestras that are doing it. This video games live thing they're doing in Brazil with Barry Lynch, where he's basically getting all his tunes played by a full orchestra in front of people. Mm. Tomb Raider live as well, which is a massive concert gonna, that's going on in London. You know. Yeah, I mean, you know, these guys, especially guys like Rob, I mean, you look back, they really were pioneers, weren't they? I mean, electronic music is everywhere now, but the things these guys could do with, like, the Sid chip and that is just, even that blows my mind. So. Yeah, yeah, and you you see interviews with Rob, and he's like, I got every kilobyte out of it. You know, he was really efficient. <laughs> so, yeah, congratulations, Rob, well-deserved. Uh, other bit of Commodore 64 news as well. Um, do you ever use Slack? Slack? Uh, no. I've well, heard of it a lot, but... Well, I, during the day, I mean, you know, kind of one of my jobs is I do social media management and, you know, write stuff for websites for a big media company. Mm -hmm. And all day long with the rest of the content team, we hang out in Slack. And it's basically a way, you know, rather than if you write an article or a bit of information, rather than emailing someone you work with, you just kind of type it in essentially a chat window and share your articles and links. And oh, all that so and it's like a shared Google Drive document or something like that. But it's more real time as well. So you can actually, you know, chat real time to each other as nice. well, private message and that kind of thing. So, you know, it's like a collaborative platform, really essentially web-based, but there are mobile apps and that that you can download so as well. So it's been around for a long time? Yeah. Uh, been around for a few years now. Um, I think it's got about 4 million users at the moment. Okay. So, you know, it's pretty pretty well used in, like, kind of content production, that kind of thing. Uh, but also, there's some guy who really thought that having it on the iPhone and on a, you know, web browser wasn't enough. <laughs> so now there is a Slack client for the Commodore 64. <laughs> It's amazing. So he could be chatting with some guy with a Windows 10 beast of a PC or a new Mac Pro and he'll yep. be on his uh, tiny C64. <laughs> well, this is a software engineer called Jeff Harris who's um, he's actually put the whole thing on GitHub. So if you want to, you know, he's open sourced it, you can have a look at it. He's right in raw 6502 assembly. Oh, good guy. And um, he's actually done this to get his Commodore 64 online. He's um, hacked up a Raspberry Pi to it as well. So he's kind of using that, you know, to... He's doing like a Java applet on there as well that kind of slings the stuff via Slack's API over to the Commodore 64. And wow. it all works. He's done a video of it working and everything. You can even do like, uh, you know, all the kind of text commands and stuff in Slack all work on the machine. You, you need to bring that into work, Dan. <laughs> Just be like, join in the conversation. <laughs> up in the office here, yeah. yeah. Shove that iMac out of the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just stuff like that. It, it always tickles me when I see like... Oh, yeah, cool. I just love it. And I think um, it's, you know, these things will never die. <laughs> I'll always find a use for them. <laughs> so thank you so much for checking out episode number 50 of the Retro Hour podcast. Um, episode 51 next week will be the Christmas Super Quiz. Prepare for madness. So we're not going to have an, a guess. It's just going to be an hour of fun. Yeah, it's going to be such a laugh next week. So uh, make sure you've got a mulled wine and a mince pie and your cheesiest Christmas jumper ready. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. There'll be some cheesy tunes, I'm sure, as well. <laughs> and of course, you can download that next Friday. It'll be the day before Christmas Eve. Yeah. Available from our website, theretrohour.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, all your favourite podcast clients. And now, for the next 45 minutes or so, this is by far one of the most interesting interviews we've ever done on this show. And what a way to go out in 2016. Here he is for the next 45 minutes or so, Mel Croucher on the Retro Hour. And we'll see you next week. Ciao. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it's our pleasure to welcome to this week's show, Mel Croucher. Hello, Mel. Greetings to you, Retro Hour. Hello, Dan. Hello, Ravi. Hello. How are you, Hello, Mel? boys and girls of podcasting. <laughs> So we always kind of start with the question, what was your first computer experience? But um, before that, I noticed you were an architect and you did some pretty major kind of buildings before that. So that might be a nice point to start with. No, I refuse to do that. Uh, my my computer experience started before I was an architect. Ah, actually. okay. It started, God, how, how do we go back? Let's go back to the early 1950s. My first computer experience was with something called a sooty xylophone. A sooty xylophone was a crappy little piece of tin that you gave children to cut their fingers on. And it consisted of eight keys, right? And each key represented a note of the scale. And each key had a different color. And the software consisted of a sheet of paper where nursery rhymes could be played if you just follow the colored codes, right? So not bad for a, how old would I be? I mean, about seven years old, I suppose. And it was it was total shit. This this side of him. 
And I, am I allowed to swear on this podcast? We can, we can beep it out. You can beep it out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll hold my peace then. Um, I got very bored with this very quickly, but discovered that if you swap the keys around on their little holy things and you wrote your own colored dots, you could make much better music. So I knew that machines and music were compatible. You kind of hacked this device then. I hacked this child device. I was a, a proto-hacker. Then, a few years later, we had this thing out the back called a player piano, which is a bit like a normal piano, except you pedal it. It's powered by uh, pneumatics. And the software for that was very similar to the sooty xylophone. It consisted of a very long roll of paper. And as you pedal, this paper traveled over a, a, a matrix, over a grid. And if there was a hole in the paper, a puff of air would go through and it would play a note. And again, it was it was heap of shit. <laughs> so I reprogrammed it and started doing my own um, my own software on pieces of paper, into, on, on wallpaper, actually. And, were these kind uh, of like punch cards you were making at home then? Exactly so. You've got it in one. I know. So, would but, this be fed into the piano so the piano would play the notes that have yep. been recorded on the paper? Pedaled it through. You could control the speed, soft pedal, the loud pedal, just like an ordinary piano. Except, being a, a rubbish piano player, I could cheat. I could cheat, <laughs> and I could create all this stuff and then just pedal it through. Right. So, then I went off to be a, a student and architect in the late 1960s. For some reason, and I still don't know how, uh, some students were let loose on um, a Royal Naval computer, a Ministry of Defence, sorry, a Ministry of Defence computer, which was huge. It was took up a whole floor of a building. As soon as I got there and I saw that the software was on punch cards, I knew exactly what computers were for. To be stupid, <laughs> to make music, <laughs> to, to make fun. I imagine that not many people had that attitude back then, though. I mean, they were a very you know, serious thing back then for most people. Absolutely serious. They were for waging war against the Russians. Yeah. I think after six months, I got this large computer to play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star <laughs> uh, in synchronized flashing colored lights, just like Sooty. See, just like the piano, just like the xylophone. And they threw me out the course. <laughs> <Of> course. <laughs> you can't Why abuse not? this multi-million dollar hardware in this way. <laughs> yeah, exactly so. So I went back to being an architect. Then, okay, shall I answer your question? I think it was 1977 and it was October. And this thing called a Commodore PET came out, which was a computer. It was just like the sooty xylophone. It had sharp bits of metal in it you cut your fingers on. <laughs> It was, it was, it was crap. It was awful, but it had a, a built-in keyboard, a little tiny built-in um, screen, and I think it had a cassette player. Yes, it did. It did. Mm. It had. A, you probably got one. You probably worship it at the temple. <laughs> of the Commodore. I wish I had one. Yeah, I have Not one. Actually. I would love one. Oh, right. And uh, it was just blindingly obvious that uh, here, here we go, folks. It's it's time. On the 19th of November, 1977, I started the first um, software house in, in Britain. The Commodore PET uh, is such an interesting design as well. You look at it now and it's kind of like what, you know, you imagine in the 1970s, that's what they thought the future looked like when you see this machine. It's, it's Darth Vader. It's Darth Vader's yeah. head, isn't it? What were the, uh, people's reactions when you told them, you know, you, you were creating a company to make computer programs? <laughs> I didn't tell them. Rabbi, I didn't tell them. Um, I was a radio producer by then. I, I was pretty old, by the way. I mean, I was no spring. I've been through two or three careers by 77. And um, one of them involved uh, recording travel guides on cassettes. Put one of my cassettes in your car, stereo player, and it said, turn left, turn right, eat at Joe's, sleep at Josephine's, blah, blah, blah. And it was a business. It did okay. But... As soon as I discovered that you could load software via cassette, it just changed everything. It changed everything. Uh, all you needed was a, a, a four-up uh, cassette duplicator, and you were in business. In fact, we didn't even have that when we started. We, we didn't even have a duplicator. We used to run it off by hand. 
Well, you mentioned that travel guide there. I mean, that must have been like the first multimedia travel guide then, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Never be first. <laughs> Never be first, Dan, because you'll screw it up. <laughs> then the others will come on and make a fortune behind you in your wake, laughing all the way. <laughs> The cassette was an interesting medium, though, because I, you know, I got my first computer about, well, it was probably about 1987 I got mine, but I remember it was an old Commodore Plus 4 that my parents got really cheap, and I yeah. opened the games first on cassette, and I thought, oh, they got me some story tapes, so, you know, yeah, it yeah. Was, I didn't well, realize. You see, you've done it again, you, you, you're, you're way ahead of me, because <laughs> I thought that I was going to force feed people, force feed people my own music, and funny sketches, and comedy, and stuff that I did on the radio. The sort of the software was an afterthought, and the first software, in fact, wasn't even on cassette. My end, uh, I broadcast it over radio. Uh, my sister was uh, used to read the news on a radio station down here, called uh, Wonderful Radio Victory, which wasn't very wonderful, but they gave me a series, <laughs> a late night series. It was a pub quiz. <laughs> my job was to go round pubs. Recording drunken idiots <laughs> doing, doing quizzes, you know. Then I used to take it back to the studios, edit it, put in all the noises and fake the applause and the laughter. and Oh, you know, just stuff you do these days. I bet that took some editing. Yeah, oh, it, took, it took minutes. It took minutes. And the highlight of this show, which was a weekly show, was to broadcast <laughs> software on air to nobody because nobody had a computer. Okay. There must, I think, the first night... We, we probably had about less than a dozen listeners. By the end of the first series, um, we were probably into the hundreds, but only low hundreds. And in the, in the next series, it started to go f a lot better. People were cottoning on to Z80 and self-assembly machines. Again, I, I don't recall their names really, but they were exotic tandies and bandies and randies and things. And um, the, an audience began to grow. And being a, a modest chap at the time, I went and got sponsorship for the entire series from the second worst brewery in the country, which shall be nameless, but I'll call it Whitbreads. <laughs> worst beer in the world. The well, second worst beer in the world. Actually. What's the first out of interest? My father used to brew it. <laughs> that, that was the worst beer in the world. Okay. Used to regularly blow up under the stairs because he put too much sugar in. <laughs> Homebrew. Ah, uh, yes, homebrew. I've lost my thread now. Well, <laughs> oh, yes. I never well, how did you broadcast this software on air then? I'm quite over curious the, about this. Over the air, mate. Are you ready? Copy it. <laughs> Two and a half minutes. It was like your radio was having an epileptic seizure. So before they had a radio teletype, which was another way of broadcasting kind Christ, of yeah, yeah, yeah. images Ten, across there. So. Ten years before. Yeah, and um, you must have been doing it like the kind of way that if you put a cassette with data on into yeah. your tape player. It just makes that crazy noises. Right. <laughs> you must have been sending that out. That was the easy bit. The difficult bit was for the hapless listener who either had to suffer this horrible noise or hold a microphone to their radio set <laughs> and record off air the code. Then they had to load it up, solve a little puzzle, which was always... Um, it was geographic coordinates, longitude and latitude, which I used for, for games later on, actually. It was a bit like GPS, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, or uh, geotagging. Yeah, they had to work out where it was on their own map, where this bloody quiz answer was. And it, I don't know what it was. It was I don't know, Stonehenge or somewhere. Then they had to telephone the radio station with the right answer. And the first one to phone got a nondescript cheap prize. Did anyone Probably ever not. win then? Oh, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. People took it very seriously. Then people started coming to the live quiz broadcasts thinking that they could um, get, get the questions in advance, not realizing that I used to take, take the tapes back and edit them. They thought it was all live. <laughs> so my editing wasn't that bad. The big jump, I suppose, was, well, as with everyone, really, was uh, the Z80 <clears throat> and Clive's first efforts. The first um, commercial games I brought out really early on, 79, sorry, 77, 78, 79, were all um, 1K compilations. And because most people were getting their software by 
typing the code in from magazines, uh, making mistakes, and it never worked. I found a ready market for compilation tapes. I used to put like 10 games, 10 1K games on a cassette, which, which were all cassettes that I had knocking around um, the studios that I used to use for, for the, these travel guides. So that was another reason for getting into computing, was to get rid of all the, all the tapes I didn't saw. <laughs> Absolutely true. This, this whole story, however long we take it, is going to be a history of accident, misfortune, and ignorance. So brace yourselves, <laughs> listeners. But, you know, but back then in like the late 70s, early 80s, when the microcomputer revolution first started, I mean, did you kind of feel a yeah. buzz then, like, you know, this is going to be big? Absolutely. Those very first meetings in like scout huts and well, village halls almost, um, where a couple of dozen people would turn up with their listings and their stuff saved on cassette and swap those cassettes or even swap the listings, uh, which were printed on sort of funny, shiny silver foil type stuff with uh, hot dot matrix nine pins, I think they were. Noisy and, things. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'll skip the whole thing about making music with those, by the way. That was good fun. That was on a, I can't remember what the machine was, but we made some great music just by changing the, uh, the dots. Fantastic. People do that on YouTube now. I've seen, and they do floppy disk really? drives as well, get it to play like the Star Wars theme. And... But because, you see, we'd all been brought up on, well, in my case, uh, science fiction books from the 50s, then Dan Dare in the comics, then Saturday morning cinema, it was all spacemen and stuff. We knew what the future was going to be like. We, we, you know, we knew it could, it could be no other way than, than uh, you know, computers and mobile phones and all this stuff. And of course, it, there was no surprise whatsoever when we found that um, there was a ready audience for, I say we, when I found, <laughs> uh, it wasn't until about 79 that I started working with other people, only because I was a dreadful programmer. I was a dreadful uh, graphic artist, and I was a half-decent musician. It was just a natural division of labor. A guy called uh, Robin Evans, who I work with to this day, became my graphic artist. He'd done a few comics with me before, and uh, I had a little publishing company, and he, he did you know, book covers and stuff. Great guy, lovely guy, mad as a fish. Imagine Robert Crumb meets Albert Steptoe. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Um, I could plug the book that we're bringing out, but I won't. Another guy called Christian, Christian Penfold. He was a, a used car salesman who was, or is probably, he's probably still going, a uh, sociopathic uh, loony. He must have offended every single person in the business by the time he finished. <laughs> I've seen him harangue crowds, walk out of meetings, bad mouth what I would have called very important people. He didn't give a monkeys. Um, oh, Andy, little Andy, who's now a granddad. We won him in a, a government raffle called the Youth Opportunities Scheme, <laughs> wherein you win a child and you <laughs> stick him up the chimney, yeah, with a computer. And you, I think we paid £7.50p a week for this kid. He was the guy who wrote Deus Ex Machina, probably the most ambitious program ever written at its time. Absolute genius, another genius. None of us knew anything about computing. So we all started from scratch. The golden age probably lasted 1984, winter 1984. And for me, it was all over by uh, spring 85 which is probably before it started for anybody else. <laughs> well, as someone that was into, you know, audio, like you said, music, um, you know, yeah. the early machines, like, you know, the ZX-8, it didn't have any, well, real audio capability at all, well, did yes, it? they did. See, what you do is you record your own audio, either a, a sketch uh, or a piece of music or uh, instructions, and you record them on a piece of tape. Then you turn the tape over and you record the computer program. So you load the computer program into your machine and then you turn the cassette over again and you've got the soundtrack. Nice. Nice. <laughs> that was about um, 25 years ahead of its time, I think, by the time we started getting proper uh, soundtracks and proper voices and things. But it worked. 
So really, you guys were just artists, musicians, kind of using this, these machines or new media to kind of express yourselves. And uh, we were, I believe, the expression is desperate. Desperate. <laughs> <laughs> desperate. And <laughs> stupid. We didn't know what our limitations were. I heard that um, Deus Ex Machinima as well was uh, not very commercially successful either, but it was incredibly pirated everywhere. Um, well, so, did you did you take that as a compliment a... or as a, a kind of, <laughs> you know, that it was being spread that far or a kind of a no, curse? I, I, I left the industry. I, I quit for twenty five years. I was so hacked off. I mean, I spent a long time on it, weeks. I, we used to knock our, our games out in a day. If we went to the pub, if we didn't come out with a game, it was, it was a bad session. Then a day to do the graphics, day to do the sound, uh, duplicate it, get some more Jiffy bags, get some stamps, blah, blah. Our adverts went out weekly. On, we used to have the back page of something called Popular Computing Weekly. Never pay for advertising, folks. Only a fool pays for advertising. We used to get that page free. Um, the quid pro quo was we had to entertain the readers. So we just did a huge piss take cartoon of the industry once a week and maybe mentioned our games in it. And we built up a huge following. When we, uh, I think my first number one game was something called Can of Worms, which you've never heard of. Uh, the charts had just started. I think maybe they, they, we were the first number one. I, I don't know. I can't remember. Deus got to um, number nothing. I made several mistakes. One was to put my heart and soul into it. There was this director called Orson Welles, who was probably the finest film director of the 20th century. And he was uh, an autodidact. And what he wanted, he got. What he wanted to do, he did. And I suffered from the same uh, megalomania. Um, I was no Orson Welles, but... I knew I could make the first ever interactive movie with a full soundtrack, stereo sound. Hired, I hired uh, you know, a guy called Ian Jury, who was the godfather of punk, mm -hmm. to play a sperm. Uh, it was filthy, by the way. It had full frontal nudity <laughs> in it. But on the spectrum, come on, guys. You know? had to use your imagination a bit there, didn't you? Exactly so. <laughs> and it was, all it was, it wasn't very ambitious. It was the entire life cycle of a human being before conception till after death. Told in one hour with John Pert, who was in it, a guy who played Doctor Who, Frankie Howard, who was a surreal um, comedian. I hired him to kill babies in it. And I had who I wanted, uh, invested everything I had, and produced not a bad piece of kit. We, we won Game of the Year. I had fantastic reviews, I mean, brilliant reviews. We got loads of exposure, and my mistake was to do it on two separate cassettes. One was for the computer program, and one was for the audio. By now, we had a 48K Spectrum to play with, but my program took uh, 80K. So what do you do? You turn the cassette over halfway through, right? You keep your score and turn the cassette over in sync to the music. That worked, but it was complicated. My second mistake was to charge 15 quid for it. This was 1984. And the reasoning for that was I needed to recoup my investment. I needed to prove that this was out the ballpark, that this was so good. You, know, you couldn't compare it with other stuff out there selling for a fiver or whatever it sold at the time. And I figured that you're getting a, a rock album, you're getting a movie, you're getting a computer game. It had beautiful artwork, fold-out posters, beautiful packaging. I mean, it was the real deal, you know? It was so expensive, <laughs> nobody could afford it, but they pirated it. Of course they did. And I wasn't really very aware of piracy at the time. It was, you know, something you'd maybe bother to do. But what they didn't pirate was the audio. They just pirated the, um, probably one side of the software. People were playing, what the hell was this? You know, this is, this, Naked figure running up the screen <laughs> <laughs> for no reason at all. And you lost half the experience without the music then? You lost most. I mean, yeah. the people that did play I mean, I, I, there's people I respect who did play it on headphones in the dark. And honestly, they said it was the best game they ever played. 
before or since. And these are guys I respect, you know, and women. When I say guys, I, I use the modern waiter sense. The collective Hi guys, term. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be your computer programmer. <laughs> Do you think the project was um, a bit too ambitious for the technology of the time then? No, it pushed the technology as far as it can go. And Andy the Boy Wonder, the schoolboy, kept saying it can't be done. And I was saying the various routines and things. I said, why can't it be done? Because nobody's ever done it before. And to me, that's, you know, that's the Orson Welles moment. Come on, guys. We, of course we can do it. So we just did it. We, Smiths wouldn't stock it because it didn't fit, fit on the shelves. So my good friend Christian, the salesman, told them to F off. Uh, we ended up selling mail order only, which was great. But the cat was out of the bag by the time I wised up. I found that Lisbon was a center of piracy at the time. There's a very nice story here. Uh, I, quit, I quit the business. I, I went off in a strop. Um, Christian went to pick up the award game of the year instead of me. <laughs> and he told them to stuff it as well. <laughs> In a way, I wish I'd been there, but it was before the days of, you know, videos and podcasts, any of that. So I've only got other people's um, records of what went on there. I just, I went off, to, I went to Moscow, went to China, went all over the place. I just left. One of the centers of piracy was Lisbon, where a young student gentleman called Mario Valente pirated Deus, and it became a bestseller in Spain, Portugal. It leaked to Brazil, which was huge. They were charging for pirate copies, were they? Sure. Right. But they did it right, okay? It, they hadn't invested money. They could afford to. They could send it out with its, uh, with its, not with its instructions, but at least what's going on and how to play it. It was the most uh, pirated of all time, wasn't it? Uh, at the time it was, yeah. yeah. It, it was, I mean, even now I, I, I discover that we were number one in Russia and Hungary and, you know, it must be at least five years ago, it was six years ago, I got a message from someone called Mario Valente, based in Lisbon. And he said, uh, hi there. Um, you started me off in business. Uh, I pirated your game. I love the game. Uh, I'm now a successful entrepreneur. Do you want to remake it? And I'll pay for it. Wow. Yeah. So days later, he flew into London and we met up and we got on really, really well. I think that's really big for someone to do that. Absolutely. And it's even bigger for them to put their hand in their pocket and write a check. He also gave me royalties, which is even better, on my own game. But what he wasn't expecting was me to go and hire Christopher Lee <laughs> <laughs> to be the narrator, to do the old uh, John Pertry part. He wasn't expecting that. I redid all the music. Uh, because now I had the time, I had the inclination, I had the skill, uh, an extra quarter century of skill to do the music. I've got, you know, symphony orchestras in there. I was able to do my Jeff Beck guitar impression. All the stuff I've always wanted to do is on that soundtrack. The game is still the same, except you can now work out that this character, who I made a hermaphrodite, is naked. It packs a, quite a big punch. And then last year, I re-released everything. So that's the old version, the new version, the director's cut, all the soundtracks, all the session photographs, of which some are pretty good. Some of the people involved, again, not many people listening to this, I imagine, would be familiar with uh, the name E.P. Thompson, Edward Thompson, one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century, a uh, Marxist philosopher. Even he lent his voice to the soundtrack. We were trying to break down... I mean, a lot of my stuff, uh, okay, it's political, you know. My rules were, and I never deviated, no violence, no sexism, and as many jokes as I can put in. That's it, okay. And if people don't like it, um, stuff them. Humor's kind of missing quite a lot in a lot of modern kind ah, of titles. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, it's getting better. I mean, I feel like we're almost back to those heady days of about 1980. Now, 1980 to 1984, I think, was the heyday. Mm. And I think we're almost back. And we're back because the, the corporates have sort of had their day. Same old crap of, you know, the violence and the, the, the fantasy and all that stuff. But be, thanks to crowdfunding, thanks to uh, 
direct distribution through apps and the web. The amateur and the, the people with the original ideas can get through. I mean, we hear all the time um, of the new breakthroughs. I love it. I just love the stuff that is not mainstream. Bedroom coding again, isn't it, essentially? Of course it is. Yeah. Of course it is. Except you don't even need to be a coder anymore. Well, um, how did you feel? Um, were you kind of frustrated when um, you, you hadn't seen the games industry progressing so much when you'd done such a pioneering interactive movie back in I'm, the 8-bit days? And not really. I got over my strop in months. Uh, I didn't come back because it was, it was... I missed the... If you don't get the moment right, then forget it. You, know, you, you can never get it back. It's like some sad old... Uh, you know, pop star <laughs> trying to make a comeback record. Uh, the only thing I'll give the sad old pop star is the pension tour, which I'm now on, okay? Uh, if you live long enough, if you fail to die, then the audience that you had as kids, and my main audience are now in their 40s and 50s and 60s, you, you won't lose them, so you can always flog them something. And uh, then also in uh, 1982, you were doing... Um kind of vlogging as a, a lesbian named Doreen. <laughs> That's hey, quite interesting. Somebody's done some research. Yeah. <laughs> well, we yeah. find this really interesting because uh, it, it was also on an early kind of teletext system. It was. Yeah, I was, um, I was Doreen Hindley. Doreen Hindley was a Northern Irish black lesbian who was not related to Myra Hindley, the mass murderer, but pretended she was. They used to send me records to listen to, which were all crap so um i used to just make it up i used to make the reviews up <laughs> and it was fantastic fun it was great i used to ask children what they thought this music and they'd tell me you know if it was good or not then i just used to write it in the voice of this woman and got to meet some really good people as well i mean a lot of people were doing the rounds at the time who were into computers so if i was doing tv there were people like um, Fergal Sharkey knocking around. Whoever was into computers was into music, really. And we'd all be at the same conferences and at the same shows and things. That was good. That was good. Even now, everyone knows everyone in the original computer game business. Some are still in it, which is probably not their heads examined, but they're, they're doing it. Yeah, I'm back, but only um, to reissue stuff. And I did a children's game last year uh, but for very very young children for infants only because i just like children's music <laughs> nursery rhymes going right back to the nursery rhyme stuff well uh, when you were originally doing these kind of uh, early mainframe stuffs and playing with making computers you know make crazy noises were you yeah. uh, aware of other people like ralph bear and people no. creating games no no i was i was a, i was a spotty, ragged-ass student in, in the depths of Portsmouth. I knew nothing, absolutely nothing about anything. Were you uh, kind of amazed when, it, when you discovered all the stuff later on? I knew, was I knew about music. I, I was into Frank Zappa quite early on, and he probably turned me on to um, the beginnings of, of avant-garde music, electronic music. And again, he, one of my big heroes. And I ended up um, running his website for a couple of years. Uh, which was very, very interesting, uh, getting to all the, the Zappa pirates. Uh, yeah, it's been an interesting time. So I haven't really been out of computing. I just came at it from different angles, whether it was writing, magazine stuff, cartoon stuff, loads of cartoons with Robin, all taking the piss out of computing. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, it's interesting because um, a lot of the kind of early rockers, actually, um, yeah. were into computing. And, you know, the Who with their... Yeah, uh, yeah. using synthesizers and kind yeah. of pioneering on that. Yeah, 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 Never absolutely. think of that connection nowadays, you know. Yeah, it's it's um, the whole idea of, of people going to university to study video games. It just, it does something horrible to me. The whole idea of, oh, it's like going to art college, you know. If you can, you can polish up your technique, of course you can. But if you haven't got it, you haven't got it. I, I, I sometimes sort of wander in and talk to the students and stuff. You know, what, are you, what are you doing? Oh, I'm a second year vector graphic background u Ben bum licker. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. And what does that do? Well, nothing really that this machine can't do. It's been done a thousand times. It's very, very sad, I think. And I, I hope they've all got careers in front of them doing something else because there's 
bugger all going on in you know in video games. You you've got to you can make it on your own if you're going to make it. I think you well, can well, make it as part of a small team. But thanks to let me think of some examples. Five is a good example. You know you're doing gigs for five dollars. Yeah. Uh, I have at the moment a team of, of gentlemen working for me, not at five dollars. Okay, it might be five hundred dollars. It might be more. It might be less. And they're producing state-of-the-art apps and websites. I'm not going to tell you what they are, because we're talking about computer games tonight. They are. The standard is fantastic. Why am I not going to computer programmers, graphic artists, and coders down the road? Because these guys are cheaper. They are reliable, and they're good. Last time I tried um, some local coders, well, I, I won't even go into it. I won't even go into it. They know not a lot. They think um, <laughs> they think I owe them money <laughs> for stuff they haven't done yet, you know? Show, deliver me the software and, and you, you get paid well, you know? It's very strange because I notice a lot of people at university nowadays are all kind of using exactly the same system and oh. uniformly creating things rather than exploring systems. You know? I mean, this isn't a downer. I love what they're, they're doing, and, and good luck to them. I know a guy down the road from me here who should be nameless, but I'll call him Carl Jeffrey, and he runs probably the biggest software house, uh, ledger software house on the South Coast, right? This was Carl, the guy who, when he was a teenager, tried to buy Atari, that guy. And you talk about a legend. This guy is a legend. He has got a factory full of programmers down the road overlooking the sound. I was out with him at lunch one time, and what are you doing? And he said, oh, just blown a million. Just what? He said, yeah, just blown a million. Okay. And he had people programming for like, I couldn't tell you how many man years that is, hundreds of people. And he didn't like the stuff that was coming out. He sat on it, threw it up, ripped it up. I don't know what he did, and it didn't come out. Now. The thought of that, that would be good luck to him. Good luck to him. Rather do that than bring out something that's not up to standard. Okay, mm. But the thought of all those hours being binned, is just, it's very, very sad, don't you think? Well, that kind of reminded me of, um, I heard a story about Steve Jobs. Have you heard when the original <laughs> iPod was uh, presented to yeah, him? Yeah. <laughs> he said, it's too big, make it smaller. And they said, well, we can't possibly make it any smaller. He threw it in a fish tank and bubbles came out. He said, there's air in there, make it yeah. smaller. <laughs> it's like a $100,000 prototype you just destroyed to yeah. prove a point. Yeah, well, he, I, he was right. Yeah. He was absolutely right. What, one of your titles that I, uh, sounds really interesting. Um, my name is Un Uncle Groucho, you win a fat cigar. No, my name is Uncle Groucho. You win a fat cigar. How dare you, sir? Impersonate me. Yeah, that was good. That was um, 1983, I think. It was a quest. That had a really good track on the back. It was a long one. It was a 10-minute rock track in three parts. A silly part, a bluesy part, and a jazzy part. I enjoyed that. Uh, well, yeah, there's an indication. I, go, I start with the music, okay? Always start with the music, then fit a game around it. Uh, at the time, there was this guy called Ronald Reagan, who was president of the United States, who would have been the worst president ever had it not been for recent events. <laughs> he, was an, he was an idiot, but at least he wasn't a rabid idiot. He was a sort of jolly idiot. My publicity campaign centered on the fact that the winner would get... To, uh, it's all about Hollywood stars, right? So you, you go and find Uncle Groucho in the game, just like the first one. There's only three games in the world, which I say every time I get interviewed, so I won't say it here. Read the book if you want to find out what the three games are. This was my only game. Uh, so it's a quest, and you find um, Groucho Marx somewhere in America. So you went to the Wild West, you went to Hollywood, you went to New York City, you went to um, wherever to see if you could find him, solve the puzzles, listen to the music, it's full of clues, read the comics, uh, the adverts, all the clues are there, buy the albums, okay, because there's clues in there. I'm not as daft as I make out, actually. <laughs> I mean, we did bloody well for a few years. You use some commercial <laughs> sense there, I can hear it, Mel. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay, okay. I, I lay it on a bit thick. We did fine, you know. I'm living in, in a couple of games here. The solution was, it was you met Mickey Mouse in Disneyland, right? But I played it, so you met Ronald Reagan uh, in the White House. 
and people really thought they were going to meet Ronald Reagan. Uh, I think the, the winner had a double initial, so MM, and they thought it was RR, simply some false clues. So we sent, we flew the winner out to Concord with his parents, because he was a bit young, and we sent him out with his, with his folks, why not? We brought them back on the QE2, we paid for them to stay in whatever the places you stay in, uh, they went around, they, they saw a lot, they went to you know, Yellowstone Park, did the things, came back, came down to see us in the office, brought us a souvenir, which I think was the head of an ape. I can't quite remember why that was, but there you go. <laughs> I think because we had a, an ape in one of our cartoons, and, uh, and we had an office parrot who was an ape as well. Um, yeah, so, oh yeah, there were four things then, my rules, non-violent, non-sexist, Make them laugh and give them prizes. Yeah, give it back. I was going to say, cause, I mean, around that time, the only other real example I can think of that, I remember Atari did like the sword quest yeah. kind of thing around the early 80s. But apart from that, I mean, it's, I can't think of any. Yeah, they were Atari. They went bust. <laughs> yeah. And they we, never give all the prizes out either. <laughs> <laughs> I just left. Well, um, one, one area we know you from, because um, quite a lot of your stuff's a bit before our days, but uh, we're massive Amiga people, so uh, the Amos books, I remember oh, yeah. you writing them. Um, how did you get involved in that, and um, did you like um, Amos? You must have uh, had a lot of yeah, experience yeah, yeah, yeah. with it. We met Franco, didn't we, uh, did at the computer you? show last year, lovely guy. Fantastic. Yeah. Is he, he's still a vet, is he, or is he retired? I don't know. I'm not sure what yeah. he's doing now, yeah. Great, yeah, great guy. guy. I, I, any guy that sticks his hand up a cow's ass for a, a living <laughs> and a guy who puts a sundial in a horse's ass for a living, right? they've got to get on fine. <laughs> I, uh, the other thing is I only work with people that I like, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, I could mention a guy called Colin Jones who programmed uh, the Commodore and MSX version of Deus Ex Machina. And he, I'm working with him again right now, you see. I mean, these, these, these relationships go on for a lifetime. You know, we're talking 30, 40 years, which is a lifetime to you guys, and it's part of a lifetime for me. Amos, yeah, a great machine. Love Francois. I like the, you know, like all that stuff. It was, was it Europress? I think it was Yeah, Europress. it was, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, by that time I was working with the guys in Macclesfield doing Crash and Zap Magazine, writing funny stuff and drawing cartoons and... In fact, we used to practically write some of the issues of the magazine, fill it with stuff, page after page of rubbish, science fiction stories. And they used to pay me, you know. And Europress got in touch and said, um, I think it was, do you want to write a computer manual? No. You can put cartoons in it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, I can do that. So I think the one with cartoons was the Sam Coupe, which was Miles Gordon. It was Amos... Uh, Stoss, can't remember. Yeah, the Atari ST version, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. But what they let me do was do all the sound effects. Yeah, we're back back to the beginning. So all the sound effects that came preloaded, uh, I originated them. And there was hundreds, you know, everything. Screams and bubbles. I used to, I used to call them um, ripple fart, you know, because you've got to name everything. <laughs> so when you typed in your code, you had to put all these names in. I just thought that was hilarious. So there's people like all over the planet typing all this, reading all this stuff, <laughs> typing it in. I bet that's me more me memorable than like, you know, colour function one or something though, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So it, it was it was fun. I hope people got had a bit of fun reading it. Well, speaking of your writing, are you, are you still writing for Computer Shopper? Yeah, sure. Yeah, how long has that been going a while now, isn't it? How long have you been doing that for? 30 years. Wow. Yeah. Um, well... Well, boys and girls in retro land, what I want you to do when you've heard this, and we haven't finished yet, but when you've heard this, just go down the page and find that PayPal button, right? And send these guys your money, because, you know, they deserve it, and all this stuff costs money, and it's great. But don't send them a lot of money. Reserve <laughs> your money for me, okay? So just go to, I don't know, Amazon or somewhere, type in my name, um, and just, you know, buy my books and buy my records and buy my computer games and then I'll be very happy too. Thank you. Right, back to the interview. <laughs> Small commercial break. <laughs> commercial break. Yeah. This message brought to you yeah, by. <laughs> I'm still writing uh, Computer Shopper. 
that's 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 the beer money. Um, I love doing the cartoon stuff. That's 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 nice. But we're bringing out um, next year. In fact, quite second quarter, I think. Uh, be three real glossy books. Some will be like collectors, I mean, really expensive stuff, signed and you know original bits of my nail clippings in it and things. <laughs> uh, one will be all the all the cartoon strips from um, Computer Shopper, great moments in computing. So that's thirty years worth, plus some stuff that was never published because well. Well, for various reasons. Then there's um, another book of all the Automata, which was the, my my software company. All that stuff. There's a Pie Man stuff and all the all the um, computer game sleeves and all the back pages and all the stuff we did, magazines and things. And the third volume is uh, one I'm not going to tell you what's in it, but they're all done by me and Robin Evans, the cartoonist. Uh, sort of limited edition stuff. We want the piano punch cards. Well, there we are. The punch cards. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, I didn't keep any. I didn't keep any. Oh, it's a show. Yeah, I've got some photographs of the, um, I've got a photograph of the xylophone and a photograph of the guts of the piano. It, all these rubber tubes in it. And uh, it must have been, it was about 1890 this thing was built. And by the 1950s and 60s, all the rubber was perishing and, <laughs> you know, getting brittle. And, and there's about three notes left on it. I had to put it to sleep, and um, this guy came round to buy it. He said, oh, yeah, nice, very nice machine, that. He said, uh, what do you want for it? So I said, I don't know about that. So we made a deal, and he took it away and put it in this trailer, and I watched him drive off in this bloody great Mercedes, and he knew exactly what it was and what it was worth, and I got ripped off. Oh, no way. So if he's one of your many thousand listeners, I want it back. <laughs> Well, Mel, it's been amazing talking to you on this week's show. So interesting. Um, we really appreciate you coming on. Splendid. Absolutely splendid. Thank you very much for asking me. And if people want to find out, you know, about the, the books and everything, have you got a website or Twitter or anywhere? Yeah, I've got a, a website. Uh, it's melcroucher.net. Uh, I'm on Facebook, sure. And if it's Amazon or wherever, Spotify, just type my name in and it usually comes up. If not, there's a young lady in Australia who shares my name. So good luck with her. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you.